Section 35 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 35. Selected Excerpts by Walter Baget. Morality and Fear from Bishop Butler. The moral principle, whatever may be said to the contrary by complacent thinkers, is really, and to most men, a principle of fear. The delights of a good conscience may be reserved for better things, but few men who know themselves will say that they have often felt them by vivid and actual experience. A sensation of shame, of reproach, of remorse, of sin, to use the word we instinctively shrink from because it expresses the meaning, is what the moral principle really and practically thrusts on most men. Conscience is the condemnation of ourselves. We expect a penalty. As the Greek proverb teaches, where there is shame there is fear. Where there is the deep and intimate anxiety of guilt, the feeling which has driven murderers and other than murderers forth to wastes and rocks and stones and tempests, we see, as it were, in a single complex and indivisible sensation, the pain and sense of guilt and the painful anticipation of its punishment. How to be free from this is the question. How to get loose from this? How to be rid of the secret tie which binds the strong man and cramps his pride, and makes him angry at the beauty of the universe, which will not let him go forth like a great animal, like the king of the forest in the glory of his might, but restrains him with an inner fear and a secret foreboding, that if he do but exalt himself he shall be abased. If he do but set forth his own dignity he will offend one who will deprive him of it. This, as has often been pointed out, is the source of the bloody rites of heathendom. You are going to battle. You are going out in the bright sun with dancing plumes and glittering spear. Your shield shines, and your feathers wave, and your limbs are glad with the consciousness of strength, and your mind is warm with glory and renown, with coming glory and unobtained renown. For who are you to hope for these? Who are you to go forth proudly against the pride of the sun, with your secret sin, and your haunting shame, and your real fear? First lie down and abase yourself. Strike your back with hard stripes. Cut deep with a sharp knife, as if you would eradicate the consciousness. Cry aloud. Put ashes on your head. Bruise yourself with stones. Then perhaps God may pardon you. Or, better still, so runs the incoherent feeling, Give him something, your ox, your ass, whole hedicombs, if you are rich enough. Anything. It is but a chance. You do not know what will please him. At any rate, what you love best yourself, that is most likely your first-born son. Then, after such gifts and such humiliation, he may be appeased. He may let you off. He may without anger let you go forth, Achilles-like, in the glory of your shield, he may not send you home as he would else, a victim of rout and treachery, with broken arms and foul limbs and weariness and humiliation. Of course, it is not this kind of fanaticism that we impute to a prelate of the English church. Human sacrifices are not respectable, and Achilles was not rector of Stanhope. But though the costume and circumstances of life change, the human heart does not. Its feelings remain. The same anxiety, the same consciousness of personal sin which led in barbarous times to what has been described, show themselves in civilized life as well. In this quieter period, their great manifestation is scrupulosity, a care about the ritual of life, an attention to meats and drinks, and cups and washings. Being so unworthy as we are, feeling what we feel, abased as we are abased, who shall say that those are beneath us? In ardent, imaginative youth they may seem so. But let a few years come. Let them dull the will, or contract the heart, or stain the mind. Then the consequent feeling will be, as all experience shows, not that a ritual is too mean, too low, too degrading for human nature, but that it is a mercy that we have to do no more, that we have only to wash in Jordan, 
that we have not even to go out into the unknown distance to seek for Abana or Farpar, rivers of Damascus. We have no right to judge. We cannot decide. We must do what is laid down for us. We fail daily even in this. We must never cease for a moment in our scrupulous anxiety to omit by no tittle and to exceed by no iota. The Tyranny of Convention from Sir Robert Peel It might be said that this necessity for newspapers and statesmen of following the crowd is only one of the results of that tyranny of commonplace which seems to accompany civilization. You may talk of the tyranny of Nero and Tiberius, but the real tyranny is the tyranny of your next-door neighbor. What law is so cruel as the law of doing what he does? What yoke is so galling as the necessity of being like him? What espionage of despotism comes to your door so effectually as the eye of the man who lives at your door? Public opinion is a permeating influence, and it exacts obedience to itself. It requires us to think other men's thoughts, to speak other men's words, to follow other men's habits. Of course, if we do not, no formal ban issues, no corporeal pain, no coarse penalty of a barbarous society is inflicted on the offender, but we are called eccentric. There is a gentle murmur of most unfortunate ideas, singular young man, well-intentioned, I dare say, but unsafe, sir, quite unsafe. Whatever truth there may be in these splenetic observations might be expected to show itself more particularly in the world of politics. People dread to be thought unsafe in proportion as they get their living by being thought to be safe. Those who desire a public career must look to the views of the living public. An immediate exterior influence is essential to the exertion of their faculties. The confidence of others is your fulcrum. You cannot, many people wish you could, go into Parliament to represent yourself. You must conform to the opinions of the electors, and they, depend on it, will not be original. In a word, as has been most wisely observed, under free institutions it is necessary occasionally to defer to the opinions of other people, and as other people are obviously in the wrong, this is a great hindrance to the improvement of our political system and the progress of our species. How to be an influential politician from Bolingbroke It is very natural that brilliant and vehement men should depreciate Harley for he had nothing which they possess, but had everything which they commonly do not possess. He was by nature a moderate man. In that age they called such a man a trimmer, but they called him ill. Such a man does not consciously shift or purposefully trim his course. He firmly believes that he is substantially consistent. I do not wish in this house, he would say in our age, to be a party to any extreme course. Mr. Gladstone brings forward a great many things which I cannot understand. I assure you he does. There is more in that bill of his about tobacco than he thinks. I am confident there is. Money is a serious thing, a very serious thing. And I am sorry to say, Mr. Disraeli commits the party very much. He avows sentiments which are injudicious. I cannot go along with him, nor can Sir John. He was not taught the catechism. I know he was not. There is a want in him of sound and sober religion, and Sir John agrees with me, which would keep him from distressing the clergy, who are very important. Great orators are very well, but as I said, how is the revenue? And the point is, not be led away, and to be moderate, and not to go to an extreme. As soon as it seems very clear, then I begin to doubt. I have been many years in Parliament, and that is my experience. We may laugh at such speeches, but there have been plenty of them in every English Parliament. A great English divine has been described as always leaving out the principle upon which his arguments rested. Even if it was stated to him, he regarded it as far-fetched and extravagant. Any politician who has this temper of mind will always have many followers and he may nearly be sure that all great measures will be passed more nearly as he wishes them to be passed than as great orators wish. Nine-tenths of mankind are more afraid of violence than of anything else, 
and inconsistent moderation is always popular, because of all qualities it is most opposite to violence, most likely to preserve the present safe existence. Conditions of Cabinet Government From the English Constitution The conditions of fitness are two. First, you must get a good legislature, and next, you must keep it good. And these are by no means so nearly connected as might be thought at first sight. To keep a legislature efficient, it must have a sufficient supply of substantial business. If you employ the best set of men to do nearly nothing, they will quarrel with each other about that nothing. Where great questions end, little parties begin. And a very happy community, with few new laws to make, few old bad laws to repeal, and but simple foreign relations to adjust, has great difficulty in employing a legislature. There is nothing for it to enact, and nothing for it to settle. Accordingly, there is great danger that the legislature, being debarred from all other kinds of business, may take to quarreling about its elective business. The controversies as to ministries may occupy all its time, and yet that time be perniciously employed, that a constant succession of feeble administrations, unable to govern and unfit to govern, may be substituted for the proper result of cabinet government a sufficient body of men long enough in power to evince their sufficiency. The exact amount of non-elective business necessary for a parliament which is to elect the executive cannot, of course, be formally stated. There are no numbers and no statistics in the theory of constitutions. All we can say is that a parliament with little business which is to be as efficient as a parliament with much business must be in all other respects much better. An indifferent parliament may be much improved by the steadying effect of grave affairs, but a parliament which has no such affairs must be intrinsically excellent, or it will fail utterly. But the difficulty of keeping a good legislature is evidently secondary to the difficulty of first getting it. There are two kinds of nations which can elect a good parliament. The first is a nation in which the mass of the people are intelligent and in which they are comfortable, where there is no honest poverty, where education is diffused and political intelligence is common, it is easy for the mass of the people to elect a fair legislature. The ideal is roughly realized in the North American colonies of England and in the whole free states of the Union. In these countries there is no such thing as honest poverty. Physical comfort, such as the poor cannot imagine here, is there easily attainable by healthy industry. Education is diffused much and is fast spreading. Ignorant emigrants from the old world often prize the intellectual advantages of which they are themselves destitute and are annoyed at their inferiority in a place where rudimentary culture is so common. The greatest difficulty of such new communities is commonly geographical. The population is mostly scattered, and where population is sparse, discussion is difficult. But in a country very large as we reckon in Europe, a people really intelligent, really educated, really comfortable, would soon form a good opinion. No one can doubt that the New England states, if they were a separate community, would have an education, a political capacity, and an intelligence such as the numerical majority of no people equally numerous has ever possessed. In a state of this sort, where all the community is fit to choose a sufficient legislature, it is possible, it is almost easy, to create that legislature. If the New England states possessed a cabinet government as a separate nation, they would be as renowned in the world for political sagacity as they now are for diffused happiness. Why Early Societies Could Not Be Free From Physics and Politics I believe the general description in which Sir John Lubbock sums up his estimate of the savage mind suits the patriarchal mind. Savages, he says, have the character of children with the passions and strength of men. And this is precisely what we should expect. An inherited drill, science says, makes modern nations what they are. Their born structure bears the trace of the laws of their fathers. But the ancient nations came into no such inheritance. They were the descendants of people who did what was right in their own eyes. They were born to no tutored habits, no preservative bonds, and therefore they were at the mercy of every impulse and blown by every passion. Again, I at least cannot call up to myself the loose conceptions, as they must have been, of morals which then existed. 
if we set aside all the element derived from law and polity which runs through our current moral notions i hardly know what we shall have left the residuum was somehow and in some vague way intelligible to the anti-political man but it must have been uncertain wavering and unfit to be depended upon in the best cases it existed much as the vague feeling of beauty now exists in mind sensitive but untaught a still small voice of uncertain meaning in unknown something modifying everything else and higher than anything else yet in form so indistinct that when you looked for it it was gone or if this be thought the delicate fiction of a later fancy then morality was at least to be found in the wild spasms of wild justice half punishment half outrage but anyhow being unfixed by steady law it was intermittent vague and hard for us to imagine to sum up law rigid definite concise law is the primary want of early mankind that which they need above anything else that which is requisite before they can gain anything else but it is their greatest difficulty as well as their first requisite the thing most out of their reach as well as that most beneficial to them if they reach it in later ages many races have gained much of this discipline quickly though painfully a loose set of scattered clans has been often and often forced to substantial settlement by a rigid conqueror the romans did half the work for above half europe but where could the first ages find romans or a conqueror men conquer by the power of government and it was exactly government which then was not the first ascent of civilization was at a steep gradient though when now we look down upon it it seems almost nothing how the step from no polity to polity was made distinct history does not record but when once polities were begun there is no difficulty in explaining why they lasted whatever may be said against the principle of natural selection in other departments there is no doubt of its predominance in early human history the strongest killed out the weakest as they could and i need not pause to prove that any form of polity is more efficient than none that an aggregate of families owning even a slippery allegiance to a single head would be sure to have the better of a set of families acknowledging no obedience to any one but scattering loose about the world and fighting where they stood homer's cyclops would be powerless against the feeblest band so far from its being singular that we find no other record of that state of man so unstable and sure to perish was it that we should rather wonder at even a single vestige lasting down to the age when for picturesqueness it became valuable in poetry but though the origin of polity is dubious we are upon the terra firma of actual records when we speak of the preservation of polities perhaps every young englishman who comes nowadays to aristotle or plato is struck with their conservatism fresh from the liberal doctrines of the present age he wonders at finding in those recognized teachers so much contrary teaching they both unlike as they are hold with xenophon so unlike both that man is the hardest of all animals to govern of plato it might indeed be plausibly said that the adherents of an intuitive philosophy being the tories of speculation have commonly been prone to conservatism in government but aristotle the founder of the experienced philosophy ought according to that doctrine to have been a liberal if any one ever was a liberal in fact both of these men lived when men had not had time to forget the difficulties of government we have forgotten them altogether we reckon as the basis of our culture upon an amount of order of tacit obedience a prescriptive governability which these philosophers hope to get as a principal result of their culture we take without thought as a datum what they hunted as a quasi tuum in early times the quantity of government is much more important than its quality what you want is a comprehensive rule binding men together making them to do much the same things telling them what to expect of each other fashioning them alike and keeping them so what this rule is does not matter so much a good rule is better than a bad one but any rule is better than none while for reasons which a jurist will appreciate none can be very good 
But to gain that rule, what may be called the impressive elements of a polity are incomparably more important than its useful elements. How to get the obedience of men is the hard problem. What you do with that obedience is less critical. To gain that obedience, the primary condition is the identity, not the union but the sameness, of what we now call church and state. No division of power is then endurable without danger, probably without destruction. The priest must not teach one thing and the king another. King must be priest and prophet king. The two must say the same thing because they are the same. The idea of difference between spiritual penalties and legal penalties must never be awakened. Indeed, early Greek thought or early Roman thought would never have comprehended it. There was a kind of rough public opinion, and there were rough, very rough, hands which acted on it. We now talk of political penalties and ecclesiastical prohibition and the social censure, but they were all one then. Nothing is very like those old communities now, but perhaps a trades union is as near as most things. To work cheap is thought to be a wicked thing, and so some broad head puts it down. The object of such organizations is to create what may be called a cake of custom. All the actions of life are to be submitted to a single rule for a single object that gradually created hereditary drill, which science teaches to be essential, and which the early instinct of men saw to be essential too. That this regime forbids free thought is not an evil, or rather, though an evil, it is the necessary basis for the greatest good. It is necessary for making the mold of civilization and hardening the soft fiber of early man. Benefits of Free Discussion in Modern Times From Physics and Politics in this manner polities of discussion broke up the old bonds of custom which were now strangling mankind, though they had once aided and helped it, but this is only one of the many gifts which those polities have conferred, are conferring, and will confer on mankind. I am not going to write a eulogium on liberty, but I wish to set down three points which have not been sufficiently noticed. Civilized ages inherit the human nature which was victorious in barbarous ages, and that nature is in many respects not all that suited to civilized circumstances. A main and principal excellence in the early times of the human races is the impulse to action. The problems before men are then plain and simple. The man who works hardest, the man who kills the most deer, the man who catches the most fish, even later on, the man who tends the largest herds, or the man who tills the largest field, is the man who succeeds. The nation which is quickest to kill its enemies, or which kills most of its enemies, is the nation which succeeds. All the inducements of early society tend to foster immediate action. All its penalties fall on the man who pauses. The traditional wisdom of those times was never weary of incalculating that delays are dangerous and that the sluggish man, the man who roasteth not that which he took in hunting, will not prosper on the earth, and indeed will very soon perish out of it, and in consequence an inability to stay quiet, an irritable desire to act directly, is one of the most conspicuous failings of mankind. Pascal said that most of the evils of life arose from man's being unable to sit still in a room, and though I do not go that length, it is certain that we should have been a far wiser race than we are, if we had been readier to sit quiet. We should have known much better the way in which it was best to act when we came to act. The rise of physical science, the first great body of practical truth provable to all men, exemplifies this in the plainest way. If it had not been for quiet people who sat still and studied the sections of the cone, if other quiet people had not sat still and studied the theory of infinitesimals, or other quiet people had not sat still and worked out the doctrine of chances, the most dreamy moonshine, as the purely practical mind would consider of all pursuits, if idle stargazers had not watched long and carefully the motions of the heavenly bodies, our modern astronomy would have been impossible, and without our astronomy, our ships, our colonies, our seamen, all which make modern life modern life, could not have existed. 
ages of sedentary quiet thinking people were required before that noisy existence began and without those pale preliminary students it never could have been brought into being and nine-tenths of modern science is in this respect the same it is the produce of men whom their contemporaries thought dreamers who were laughed at for caring for what did not concern them who as the proverbs went walked into a well from looking at the stars who were believed to be useless if any one could be such and the conclusion is plain that if there had been more such people if the world had not laughed at those there were if rather it had encouraged them there would have been a great accumulation of proved science ages before there was it was the irritable activity the wish to be doing something that prevented it most men inherited a nature too eager and too restless to be quiet and find out things and even worse with their idle clamor they disturbed the brooding hen they would not let those be quiet who wished to be so and out of whose calm thought much good might have come forth if we consider how much science has done and how much it is doing for mankind and if the over-activity of men is proved to be the cause why science came so late into the world and is so small and scanty still that will convince most people that our over-activity is a very great evil but this is only part and perhaps not the greatest part of the harm that over-activity does as i have said it is inherited from times when life was simple objects were plain and quick action generally led to desirable ends if a kills b before b kills a then a survives and the human race is a race of a's but the issues of life are plain no longer to act rightly in modern society requires a great deal of previous study a great deal of assimilated information a great deal of sharpened imagination and these prerequisites of sound action require much time and i was going to say much lying in the sun a period of mere passiveness argument to show that the same vice of impatience damages war philanthropy commerce and even speculation but it will be said what has government by discussion to do with these things will it prevent them or even mitigate them it can and does do both in the very plainest way if you want to stop instant and immediate action always make it a condition that the action shall not begin till a considerable number of persons have talked over it and have agreed on it if those persons be people of different temperaments different ideas and different educations you have an almost infallible security that nothing or almost nothing will be done with excessive rapidity each kind of persons will have their spokesman each spokesman will have his characteristic objection and each his characteristic counter proposition and so in the end nothing will probably be done or at least only the minimum which is plainly urgent in many cases this delay may be dangerous in many cases quick action will be preferable a campaign as macaulay well says cannot be directed by a debating society and many other kinds of action also require a single and absolute general but for the purpose now in hand that of preventing hasty action and ensuring elaborate consideration there is no device like a polity of discussion the enemies of this object the people who want to act quickly see this very distinctly they are forever explaining that the present is an age of committees that the committees do nothing that all evaporates in talk their great enemy is parliamentary government they call it after mr carlyle the national palaver they add up the hours that are consumed in it and the speeches which are made in it and they sigh for a time when england might again be ruled as it once was by a cromwell that is when an eager absolute man might do exactly what other eager men wish to and do it immediately all these invectives are perpetual and many-sided they come from philosophers each of whom wants some new scheme tried from philanthropists who want some evil abated from revolutions who want some old institution destroyed from new eroists who want their new era started forthwith and they are all distinct admissions that a polity of discussion is the greatest hindrance to the inherited mistake of human nature 
to the desire to act promptly, which in a simple age is so excellent, but which in a later and complex time leads to so much evil. The same accusation against our age sometimes takes a more general form. It is alleged that our energies are diminishing, that ordinary and average men have not the quick determination nowadays which they used to have when the world was younger, that not only do not committees and parliaments act with rapid decisiveness, but that no one now so acts. And I hope that in fact this is true, for according to me it proves that the hereditary barbaric impulse is decaying and dying out. So far from thinking the quality attributed to us a defect, I wish that those who complain of it were far more right than I much fear they are. Still certainly, eager and violent action is somewhat diminished, though only by a small fraction of what it ought to be. And I believe that this is in great part due, in England at least, to our government by discussion, which has fostered a general intellectual tone, a diffused disposition to weigh evidence, a conviction that much may be said on every side of everything which the elder and more fanatic ages of the world wanted. This is the real reason why our energies seem so much less than those of our fathers. When we have a definite end in view, which we know we want and which we think we know how to obtain, we can act well enough. The campaigns of our soldiers are as energetic as any campaigns ever were. The speculations of our merchants have greater promptitude, greater audacity, greater vigor than any such speculations ever had before. In old times a few ideas got possession of men and communities, but this is happily now possible no longer. We see how incomplete these old ideas were, how almost by chance one seized on one nation and another on another. How often one set of men have persecuted another set for opinions on subjects of which neither, we now perceive, knew anything. It might be well if a greater number of effectual demonstrations existed among mankind, but while no such demonstrations exist, and while the evidence which completely convinces one man seems to another trifling and insufficient, let us recognize the plain position of inevitable doubt. Let us not be bigots with a doubt and persecutors without a creed. We are beginning to see this, and we are railed at for so beginning. But it is a great benefit, and it is to the incessant prevalence of detective discussion that our doubts are due. And much of that discussion is due to the long existence of a government requiring constant debates, written and oral. Origin of Deposit Banking from Lombard Street In the last century, a favorite subject of literary ingenuity was conjectural history, as it was then called. Upon grounds of probability, a fictitious sketch was made of the possible origin of things existing. If this kind of speculation were now applied to banking, the natural and first idea would be that large systems of deposit banking grew up in the early world, just as they grow up now in any large English colony. As soon as any such community becomes rich enough to have much money, and compact enough to be able to lodge its money in single banks, it at once begins to do so. English colonists do not like the risk of keeping their money, and they wish to make an interest on it. They carry from home the idea and the habit of banking, and they take to it as soon as they can in their new world. Conjectural history would be inclined to say that all banking began thus but such history is rarely of any value. The basis of it is false. It assumes that what works most easily when established is that which it would be the most easy to establish, and that what seems simplest when familiar would be most easily appreciated by the mind, though unfamiliar. But exactly the contrary is true. Many things which seem simple, and which work well when firmly established, are very hard to establish among new people, and not very easy to explain to them. Deposit banking is of this sort. Its essence is that a very large number of persons agree to trust a very few persons, or some one person. Banking would not be a profitable trade if bankers were not a small number, and depositors in comparison an immense number. But to get a great number of persons to do exactly the same thing is always very difficult. 
and nothing but a very palpable necessity will make them on a sudden begin to do it and there is no such palpable necessity in banking if you take a country town in france even now you will not find any such system of banking as ours checkbooks are unknown and money kept on running account by bankers is rare people store their money in a caisse at their houses steady savings which are waiting for investment and which are sure not to be soon wanted may be lodged with bankers but the common floating cash of the community is kept by the community themselves at home they prefer to keep it so and it would not answer a banker's purpose to make expensive arrangements for keeping it otherwise if a branch such as the national provincial bank opens in an english country town were opened in a corresponding french one it would not pay its expenses you could not get any sufficient number of frenchmen to agree to put their money there and so it is in all countries not of british descent though in various degrees deposit banking is a very difficult thing to begin because people do not like to let their money out of their sight especially do not like to let it out of sight without security still more cannot all at once agree on any single person to whom they are content to trust it unseen and unsecured hypothetical history which explains the past by what is simplest and commonest in the present is in banking as in most things quite untrue the real history is different new wants are mostly supplied by adaptation not by creation or foundation something having been created to satisfy an extreme want it is used to satisfy less pressing wants or to supply additional conveniences on this account political government the oldest institution in the world has been the hardest worked at the beginning of history we find it doing everything which society wants done and forbidding everything which society does not wish done in trade at present the first commerce in a new place is a general shop which beginning with articles of real necessity come shortly to supply the oddest accumulation of petty comforts and the history of banking has been the same the first banks were not founded for our system of deposit banking or for anything like it they were founded for much more pressing reasons and having been founded they or copies from them were applied to our modern uses gives a sketch of the banks started as finance companies to make or float government loans and to give good coin and sketches their function of remitting money these are all uses other than those of deposit banking which banks supplied that afterwards became in our english sense deposit banks by supplying these uses they gained the credit that afterwards enabled them to gain a living as deposit banks being trusted for one purpose they came to be trusted for a purpose quite different ultimately far more important though at first less keenly pressing but these wants only affect a few persons and therefore bring the bank under the notice of a few only the real introductory function which deposit banks at first perform is much more popular and it is only when they can perform this most popular kind of business that deposit banking ever spreads quickly and extensively this function is a supply of the paper circulation to the country and it will be observed that i am not about to overstep my limits and discuss this as a question of currency in what form the best paper currency can be supplied to a country is a question of economical theory with which i do not meddle here i am only narrating unquestionable history not dealing with an argument where every step is disputed and part of the certain history is that the best way to diffuse banking in a community is to allow the banker to issue bank notes of small amount that can supersede the metal currency this amounts to a subsidy to each banker to enable him to keep open a bank till depositors choose to come to it the reason why the use of bank paper commonly precedes the habit of making deposits in banks is very plain it is a far easier habit to establish in the issue of notes the banker the person to be most benefited can do something he can pay away his own promises and loans in wages or in payment of debts but in the getting of deposits he is passive his issues depend on himself his deposits on the favor of others and to the public the change is far easier too to collect a great mass of deposits with the same banker a great number of persons must agree to do something 
but to establish a note circulation, a large number of persons need only do nothing. They receive the banker's notes in the common course of their business, and they have only not to take those notes to the banker for payment. If the public refrain from taking trouble, a paper circulation is immediately in existence. A paper circulation is begun by the banker and requires no effort on the part of the public. On the contrary, it needs an effort of the public to be rid of notes once issued. But deposit banking cannot be begun by the banker and requires a spontaneous and consistent effort in the community, and therefore paper issue is the natural prelude to deposit banking. End of section 35